اهلا وسهلا بحضراتكم كل متابعي تلفزيون اليوم السابع في كل مكان في تغطيه حصريه هكون مع حضراتكم فيها هشام عبد التواب من ايام اتفاجئ العالم كله بالاعلان عن نجاح اول عمليه لزراعه قلب خنزير وهو معدل وراثيا في جسم انسان وهي الحقيقه كانت العمليه الاولى من نوعها للمره الاولى في تاريخ البشريه والحقيقه انه يعني من وقت ما تم الاعلان عن اجراء العمليه بنجاح بدا زميلنا رامي نوار في البحث عن الدكتور بارتلي جريفيث وهو الجراح العالمي اللي اجرى هذه العمليه للمريض ديفيد بينت عشان بالتاكيد نجري معاه اول حوار في وسائل الاعلام العربيه ويحكي لنا اهم التفاصيل اللي حصلت في هذه العمليه احنا معاكم في تلفزيون يوم السابع بننفرد بهذا اللقاء الحصري مع الجراح العالمي بارتلي جريفيث صاحب الانجاز العالمي الكبير وهو بالتاكيد اللقاء الاول ليه في وسائل الاعلام العربيه والمصريه. Thank you so much Dr. Griffith for being with us. Congratulations for making history with this big big scientific achievement. Thank you very much. It's nice to be with you. Thank you so much. Can you please tell us more about the nature of this surgery? Well, I am a professor of surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and uh, I have spent my 40-year-long career to date um, treating end-stage heart disease and lung disease, much of which uh, has included the use of uh, transplanted organs. There are unmet needs for donors, and as long ago as uh, the very, very early um, 90s, uh, it was recognized that perhaps animal organs could be modified so that they might be more useful for transplantation. I'm the beneficiary of the work that's really been done over the last 20 years on these organs. And um, uh, we have been investigating uh, the use of a genetically engineered pig heart uh, in the laboratory. This began five years ago for me, but uh, 25 years ago for my partner, Dr. Mohideen. Dr. Mohideen uh, joined our faculty five years ago and brought with him his collected history of exploration in this field. Mm -hmm. He was able to show that he could extend the, the pulse in hearts that were implanted into the abdomen of baboons from gene edited porcine hearts. He had one such abdominal heart last more than three years. When he came to the University of Maryland, we teamed up with the idea of translating his model of intra-abdominal implantation to a true model of xeno heart transplantation in which the baboon would give up his own heart and the pig heart would be placed in the chest and would be required to fully support the animal uh, just as if uh, he had had a human heart transplant uh, in our clinic every day. Over the last uh, five years and particularly the last two years, we've made great progress and our animals have done very, very well. Um, the longest living nine months with a very good looking heart uh, uh, function and also the tissue of that heart uh, failed to show any rejection. As a consequence, uh, when I met a patient in the hospital who was desperate for an emergency treatment but could not have a human heart transplant, uh, we suggested uh, that he might consider the animal transplant. He was, as we say, grasping at any opportunity, and so he agreed. And we petitioned the FDA for emergency use of this animal heart. Mm -hmm. The heart that we used uh, came from our company that has sponsored much of our research, uh, Revivacor. And Re Revivacor gave us a, a uh, heart from a 250 pound pig that it had 10 gene edits. We implanted that uh, into our patient on the 7th of January, and uh, the patient's heart has continued to function very well. Mm -hmm. Yes, perfect. And when exactly uh, did you do the surgery for uh, David Bennett? And how actually uh, did you choose him for the surgery? Well, the surgery was performed on the 7th. We began speaking to him 
December 15th about the potential. Uh, again, he could not have a human heart transplant because he was too sick and he'd had a history of not following up with his doctor's orders. We call that lack of compliance and uh, it is a hard stop in our transplant program uh, not to include patients who have a history of not following their doctor's regimens. Mm -hmm. We reviewed his situation with other major transplant centers, all of whom agreed that he would not be a candidate for traditional heart transplant. Yes. So can we say that uh, patients who are desperate to have human uh, heart uh, transplant, in this case, we can use the animal uh, transplant? Huh. One day, that will be true. This mm -hmm. is an experimental transplant. We have no idea whether it will benefit uh, David. Uh, the early, uh, early signs of the heart function suggest that he is not rejecting the heart because of the gene edits and because of the unique immune suppression that he is receiving in addition. Mm -hmm. our, our hope is that this work will continue. We will learn more. Others will add their fund of knowledge, join the experimentation, so to speak. And one day, perhaps within 10 years, we might have organs on demand. Mm -hmm. So you said to me he's not rejecting uh, the, the, the new heart. So how is it going with him so far after the surgery? Very well. Mm -hmm. So he yeah, is functioning he well? Very, well, he was very sick. He hadn't been out of bed for over two months. And mm -hmm. uh, we've just begun the process of getting him up and moving him around. Mm -hmm. So can you please tell me what would uh, have happened uh, to uh, David uh, Bennett if he did not actually undergo the surgery. I believe every expert in heart failure management who saw him thought that uh, he would not survive to leave the hospital, that he was totally dependent on the very large doses of medications, uh, which were actually insufficient, even in spite of being large doses. Hmm. And he required uh, survival on a platform of a heart-lung machine that was brought to his bedside. We call that ECMO. Uh, so he was really being kept alive by the heart-lung machine. Um, and that is something we can only do in the hospital. And you can't be on it forever. You know, it's a rather short-term fix. Yes. So if, if we didn't have an option for transplant of any kind, we would have by this time removed him from the heart lung machine. And then in all likelihood, he would have become he would have become quite sick and uh, probably would have died. Yeah, yeah that's obvious. Um, what worried you the most about doing this surgery for the first time? Well, I think any, any surgeon experienced uh, with heart transplantation would not be overly worried about the actual procedure, but to, for the first time, expect an animal organ as discordant as a pig is from man uh, to function uh, is a big, big step. And uh, we hoped that our work in the laboratory would translate to a human patient. So I worried about that. And I think it took like eight hours, the surgery. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We, uh, from start to finish, about eight hours. Yes, sir. Yes. So does it need the approval of the medical authorities uh, to undergo the surgery or it's just the patient's call? Uh, no. In fact, we went through a, a, a series of regulatory hurdles. Mm -hmm. The FDA... Um, gave us permission after reviewing our emergency application uh, over a period of 10 days between December 20th and New Year's Eve night uh, when they actually got back and approved it. It was quite an interesting email to get New Year's Eve at 5.30 p.m. that we were approved. I was uh, very, very happy. And so I was able to have an extra glass of wine with New Year's. Um, yes. we, we, then, we then had to approach our institution, our hospital, mm -hmm. which also has something called an IRB, so that there is a, uh, 
research protection um, uh, and, you know, umbrella over all patients in our academic medical center. Uh, so we were reviewed by the IRB and also uh, by our institution's medical board and uh, legal team. That took about five days to get approval and to set up protocols that were unique for this type of transplant of an animal known to carry viruses. Um, the concern was that the zoonosis uh, potential, which means transferring a pathogen or an, an illness from the pig to a human, uh, was very low risk and that we could manage it. Yes, and I think uh, you have uh, faced a lot of challenges um, in the whole process, I guess. Can you please tell me more about the challenges and how you actually faced them? Well, fortunately, I have a nice team that works with me and I with them. And uh, the, uh, my partner, uh, Dr. Mohammed Mohideen, um, is really the scientific director of what we call the Xeno Transplant Program. Yes. My job has been to create all of his knowledge into a package that would translate, you know, into a human case. Um, he's I a, think uh, your, partner's, your partner's name uh, seems to be uh, from the Middle East. Can you please tell me more about him? He's, he's uh, Pakistani. Okay. Uh, but a very uh, devout Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he has taught me a lot about, uh, about his faith. And uh, he is a wonderful, wonderful man. Amazing. Uh, can we get back to the challenges you were talking about them? Well, uh, it's just a matter of, you, you know, um, proposing mm -hmm. such, a, such a surgery is uh, kind of science fiction in some ways. So part of the challenge was to impress my bosses in the medical center and their bosses, right? And everybody has bosses, right? That this yes. was a good idea. Um, everybody who I work with pledges to try to save life at almost any cost. But was this a reasonable uh, cost? And was this a reasonable thing to do? Review of our research would suggest that we were prepared for this. Uh, our animal data suggested that, that it was not unreasonable to try. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just working through all of the, um, the protocols necessary to protect nurses and intimate contacts of the patient to be sure he understood and could be uh, consented fairly, uh, that he understood the, the process that he was going through. And we had a very large uh, investment from our ethicists uh, here at the medical center who helped us get through that whole point of the patient uh, understanding and consenting uh, to what actually we were proposing. He was very sick, yes. and so there was some worry that he could maybe not really understand. And we wanted to avoid at any cost the impression that we were coercing him yes. into this experiment. Yes. A lot of people are asking, why pegs? Uh, why did you choose uh, pegs for this uh, scientific, uh, uh, scientific trial? And actually, what other potential animals can be? Well, I think the pig right now is the only reasonable one. Hmm. In the past, doctors, uh, a long time ago, you know, in the 60s, uh, into the 70s, had chosen chimpanzee and baboon organs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they didn't work very well because they weren't edited in any way. But they were closer to humans, so they might work better than, say, a pig. Yes. Um, but, but when we learned about Dolly, the... Uh, black-faced uh, sheep that was born of a white-faced mother because she was cloned, um, that opened the opportunity to begin to dream about changing the genetics of animals and, in essence, their organs, that those organs might be changed enough so that they could be accepted by the human. The, the sheep is maybe under consideration, but... Um, uh, the pig seems to have the best overall confirmation of the heart similar to human. They grow pretty quickly. Their gestational period is about 110 days. Um, and, and so the breeding, the breeding and cloning uh, necessary, you know, to, 
to sustain basically a commercial effort uh, to create organs on demand really has to happen in a, in a you know, very quick growing and easy to manage animal. The non-human primates are very small overall and they grow very, very slowly. So you can imagine if you were looking at it as a businessman, you would want to be able to grow organs on demand quickly and to respond you know, uh, for the needs. So they have settled for now on the pig. Uh, I think it probably will be the animal of choice. Yes, so do we have any other uh, potential animals? Not that I know of. Yes. So uh, will you do uh, the same surgery again for other patients in the, in the near future? I think it's premature to know. We're hopeful mm -hmm. that this patient will have a good outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that success, we, we already think it's been successful. He's out now more than 10 days from his surgery and the heart's working well. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a small measure of success. Uh, the best measure would be if he's able to go home. Uh, mm -hmm. and he can keep his heart uh, for a long time. But this is a field that has to progress slowly and in steps. And um, uh, I think that after we learn from his case, we might propose for another emergency case um, if the situation is correct. Um, the FDA has given us permission only for Mr. Bennett. Yes. In, the future, in the future, there will be a formal trial uh, of doing these genetically engineered uh, hearts provided from Revivacor uh, in multiple patients around the country. But we believe that may be a few years away. Yes. Um, I also wanted to ask you this. There were some allegations about David uh, Bennett and uh, uh, whether he deserves to undergo this surgery or not. <laughs> What, what do you think yeah. of this? What's your opinion? Yeah, well, my opinion is there wouldn't be a lot of people standing in line to have this surgery, right? So he's very brave. Uh, he had no other option, but a number of people would have chosen not to participate, I'm sure. We didn't take a heart from anyone else to give it to him, so he didn't consume a human heart, and he didn't qualify for human heart. So David, um, David was involved in, a, in an assault uh, when he was a very young man, the victim wasn't innocent. Um, the victim had a long-term disability from the assault and David uh, had some incarceration time. So David paid his dues, uh, in my mind. We would not ever really use that past history to make a decision about uh, medical aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we as doctors, um, can't, can't make judgments about anything other than the need for our care uh, and our application of our knowledge to making patients better. It's society's job to, um, you know, to, you know, to, to make decisions about whether a patient or, or a, a person should be, um, you know, incarcerated or pay a, pay a price to society, but we don't withhold care. Uh, because of somebody's uh, very distant past. We would like to thank you so much, Dr. Bartley Griffith, for being with us. Thank you for all the information. Thank you. You're very welcome, and thank you for your interest. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bartley Griffith. بنشكر بتأكيد الطبيب Bartley Griffith, الجراح العالمي صاحب الإنجاز العلمي الكبير وهو بتأكيد يعني أجرى أول عملية جراحية لزراعة قلب خنزير لإنسان كان معانا بتأكيد في لقاء حصري على التلفزيون اليوم السابع وبتأكيد بنشكر زميلنا رامي نوار على فكرة وإعداد اللقاء يعني رامي الحقيقة لا يتوقف عن الانفرادات الحصرية وبالتأكيد بنوعدكم بلقاءات كتير جاية شكرا جزيلا لحضراتكم كنت معاكم هشام عبد التواب إلى اللقاء